Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Philosophy of Voluntarism, Episode 6, with me, Danilo Cuellar from PeaceFinderism.com and Jim Limber Davis from JimLimberDavis.com. Philosophy of Voluntarism is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at BIPCOT.org. And also, we have our Patreon page finally up, patreon.com slash philosophy of voluntarism. If you want to give us a um, recurring donation, if you enjoy our work, find value, please consider donating. Also on um, jimlimberdavis.com slash POV, you can also find a link or a button for PayPal donations if you want to give just a one-time uh, donation. So, so today we're going to discuss, do emotions have a role in voluntarism or must we be logic Spock-minded automatons um, <laughs> just recognizing logical fallacies and pointing to reason when discussing voluntarism and anarchism. Is that is that what it's all about? <laughs> so, Jim, you want to start first? Well, this was, uh, this was your topic of choice, so I'm going to uh, make sure the spotlight stays on you while I don't even have a webcam yet. So uh, you start this one off. Okay. I'll just uh, follow up and try to shine as brightly as I can. <laughs> all right. So... Yeah, so um, I in, initially when I first started talking about voluntarism and anarchism, and I, I think I did go down the reason logic route and learned about all the logical fallacies and you know striving to point them out very coldly and callously and uh, stoically, and I think that works for maybe for some people who uh, are not so emotional minded, but not for most people. I think most people do have an emotional investment in the state and so we have to strive to connect with that uh, as much as possible to form bonds with the person and by just pointing out their various logical fallacies appeal to antiquity appeal to the stick um, <laughs> it might prove our own knowledge in in that genre but it doesn't necessarily shine new light for them right it doesn't doesn't affect them where they need where they need it most right which is in emotional connection and and so i love the analogy of the man and the elephant right and most people the man is the intellect or the reason and the elephant is the emotional aspect of the mind you can convince the man all you want to go left <laughs> but if the elephant wants to go right He's going to go right. <laughs> so sometimes just appealing to logic and reason is not enough, right? We also must develop our skills of communication, right? And that's what we've been talking about on this podcast is, you know, nonviolent communication. How do you form a connection with the person, right? How do you get them to not feel threatened, to not feel like they're being attacked by you? Because once they feel comfortable with you, and once they they um, interpret that you're not uh, an, an attacker on them and their beliefs, then they're going to be much more open to what you have to say and to consider what you have to say seriously. So I think that in that sense, emotions does have a very important role to play in that we must demonstrate to people that we are human beings. <laughs> we are not machines. Right. You know, we're neither we're neither Spock or we're neither wild beasts. Right? We are human beings. And so we have a mixture of both and we must learn to employ both when we're communicating with our fellow human beings. So, so yeah, that's, that's the way I look at it. That's uh, something that I actually did not put in my notes for today's uh, recording was the logical fallacy string of constant merciless slaughtering of arguments. <laughs> and uh, I just want to ask, did you say, did you say uh, that's a logical fallacy stick? Is that, is that yeah, what you said? Yeah, yeah. There's a, the appeal to the stick or also known as the appeal to force, um, which is – Oh, okay, because uh, the first thing I was thinking was, uh, wait, did he forget to mention that it's a logical uh, – the appeal to the stick in the mud? 
<laughs> well, that's a new fallacy. I have not heard of that one yet. I'm going to start using it. <laughs> no, that's, yeah. what, that's what my wife complains of me, sticking the mud. But no, <laughs> appeal to the state. Um, yeah, right. and, and if you want to further impress the people that you meet, you would you would say the Latin version, which would be argumentum ad baculum. And then they'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah, somebody said that to me one time, and I just go, I'm Batman. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's all I got. He goes, uh, so anyway, so yeah, the um, yeah the constant string of logical fallacies. That's a logical fallacy. That's a logical fallacy. That's something that is definitely oh, wow. It's just one of those. Nope, you're wrong. It's it's an immediate mm. smack in the face. You're wrong, and nobody likes that. Mm -hmm. Nobody does, unless you're into this weird after hours thing but i'm not into that so <laughs> that's not me but you know so a lot of these people get into this and, and they they go in through this everything is a logical fallacy everything's a logical fallacy and i noticed that a lot of people who do that are also the same people who are still oftentimes very angry at advocates of government and this anger is one of those things that while logically and, and reasonably, they are not incorrect. They're not doing themselves any service by continuing to point out things that are wrong. That, as like you were getting at, absolutely does not create connections, and we want to connect with other individuals. So when we are trying to understand if emotions actually fit with voluntarism, I think absolutely uh, emotions really do. Uh, fit with voluntarism there there's room for them all over the place i mean we talked about this a while back to a lesser degree with uh, nonviolent communication and for those listeners who decided to take the plunge and follow up uh, with the youtube search for marshall Rogers, rosenberg's tutorials about uh, nonviolent communication you're probably already familiar with this idea that emotions are more or less a series of needs and wants and one of the things that people think about when they get into this needs and wants is that once they start delving into it, many of these are rooted in acceptance, desire to be invested in by others uh, with patience to understand ideas. And mostly it ends up being, well, the advocate of government is like saying, I want you to understand this is why I'm advocating government. But the dissenter of government stuck in their ways of constant logical fallacy is saying, well, I want you to understand this is why government is destructive. But they're both looking at different puzzle pieces to the same puzzle. Neither one of them are taking the time to zoom out and look at the big picture. And the big picture is what is their common ground? What do both individuals want? And they're not they're they're still stuck on those emotions and I think those emotions end up getting stuck there or they get stuck on those stepping stones of thought because of the emotions. A lot of these individuals, they do not realize that they are actually making logically fueled emotional arguments instead of emotionally fueled logical arguments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of people, when they do this, uh, specifically when they are doing this, they concerning, I would say, Descent of government, they either go full emotional argument with some logic in it and how they just totally degrade their – whoever they're talking to or they go the route of no emotions whatsoever and they mask every, every single emotion. I mean like emotions should be understood. Removing emotions is something which will take away our humanity or a big part of it. But we cannot separate the two. And that is something which the culture of masculinity does by demanding boys and other men feel certain ways and say, oh, man up. You know, That's one of those ways where emotions are, are used to manipulate people. And I, that may not be clear to everybody, but that's kind of the same impression I get anyway from discussing with a lot of individuals about liberty. And they say, oh, don't go – don't get – Oh, you got the feels or whatever it is that they, they, they've been saying recently. But they, when I first got into it, they were just saying, 
you need to you need to uh, toughen up because mm. the real world doesn't care about how you feel. <laughs> no, no. The people who understand how to convey an idea and make connections with people understand that that they will they will take care of that and try to make an attempt to actually reach out and connect with individuals that way. But uh, I this I think the big thing here is that people don't understand that there's nothing wrong with emotions. Emotions are just fine. It's just how we use them, not how we control them, how we use them and recognize what they are for because emotions convey information also. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't pay attention to that, then emotions are going to just be something that also hinder our ability to connect with other people, help explain new ideas to people and so on, and just move the philosophy of voluntarism forward. Yeah, you remind me of a, um, a recent interaction I had at the grocery store, because every time I talk to people, especially women, <laughs> about my podcast and my YouTube channel and my website, I, I feel like I'm not, make, I'm not really making a logical argument. I don't really feel like I'm doing that. I feel like I'm just connecting with the person. And in the process we eventually start talking about volunteerism, you know, but first I make the connection, you know, I, you, you convey that I'm a decent, moral, compassionate human being. And once they understand that things go a lot easier, right? So, so yeah, so recently I was at the grocery store and as the cashier, this woman was, was, uh, was scanning my groceries. We start, I started asking her about her hair, about different things. And then, and eventually, by the end, I said I have a podcast, and she said, "Really? What's your podcast?" <laughs> so I gave her my my little volunteer's card. So I gave her the card, and so it's kind of interesting that I uh, I, I garnered that much trust in our conversation just in that small amount of time. <laughs> that is impressive, right? Right. So, and and that's happened to me a couple of times. If I get the chance to talk to somebody, you know, I really focus on that person. And my and my my younger brother is always. He's always asking me, how do you do that? You know? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I just, I just figure out ways to connect with people. I don't know. I just take something about them and I ask a question. And, you know, for me, it's a lot of questions, you know? I was asking her about her hair, but somebody maybe be a ring, maybe be a tattoo, you know, just ask them about because Because a lot of people, most people, I would say, love to talk about themselves, right? Which is fine. <laughs> you want to make them feel comfortable. So I ask them a lot of questions about themselves. And most people are not threatened by that, right? Maybe if somebody else did it, they would be threatened. But with me, I guess I, I put off an energy where um, they understand that they're genuine questions, you know? And so, yeah, <laughs> so that was a wonderful experience that just through that simple, quick interaction, it seems like uh, I got another listener. <laughs> you know, so I think, I think this ability to talk to people it's not just about spreading anarchism and volunteerism. It's about communicating with people and talking to people and forming connections. That ability is so powerful and it's very useful in many different aspects of your life, right? And just as just as the ability to make people laugh, right? Having a great sense of humor, which I think also is probably equally as important as forming an emotional connection, is making people laugh. You know, how do you how do you make people laugh? Again, without turning them off, without having them feel like you're attacking them or someone else. Just so I, I, I do that a lot, and I think that also plays a large role in um, calming people down, right? A, 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 assuaging their fears about someone that they they never met, right? So yeah. <laughs> well, that's uh, it's very interesting. I, I do something a little different, but if you just randomly came up to me and I didn't know who you were, and you started. Uh, ask me a lot of questions, I'd be feeling a lot, really uncomfortable really fast. <laughs> yeah. I would ask you probably one of two questions. Are you from the government <laughs> or are you hitting on me? So right. I would be really weird. I'd be like, no, wait a minute. Hang on. Hang on. Slow down. I would be searching your finger for a ring and then I would tell my girlfriend immediately, this is what happened. So, you know, uh, that, that's, that's really great that you're able to do that. And a lot of people... So this is something that, I, that I'm kind of glad you brought up because everybody has different skills about being able to connect and relay ideas. 
you, like I mentioned in another video, are essentially the Bruce Wayne of making connections. <laughs> With networking, you know, you can get in and get get the connections and get be very trustworthy and get that instant sense of, yeah, he's not a threat. Mm. So you get that in there. But that doesn't work for, for everybody. Mm. I mean, for me, my means to make connections is a little different because of my past. Mm. I know in private conversations and in uh, other avenues or other outlets we have talked about that in the past i think on the one of the first episodes of the non-aggression parenting uh podcast that you do uh we talked about that where my parents very my father specifically very disciplinarian so i don't make connections very quickly or easily with people i hide that that portion of of myself but where i do shine in terms of getting an audience in person is by showing trust and communication leadership and problem solving. That's what I do. I make the connection with individuals. So everywhere I go, if there's a chance to problem solve or specifically at my job site, my part-time job and any other job that I take up, I always am into problem solving and getting people to understand fundamental ideas, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills. I explain to people, this is how I made this happen. And I'll find ways of working in other ideas in there as well and getting into talking about voluntarism or, or anything like that or in the case of when it comes to voting a lot of people I, I don't know what it is about people but after I've been working with them for even just a couple of days they oftentimes start bringing up political things like did you vote about this did you I'm like, nope I'm not really interested in voting and like oh man really so, really because it's just not – I don't feel comfortable asking somebody else to intervene into somebody else's life. It's, it makes me feel bad mm. or I just, I just feel bad about that. I, I can't handle that. So one of the things that, that I notice that a lot of people really take kindly to, and I've been, I've been saying this for a while off and on, I don't vote because I'm my own master. I accept the things that I cannot change, and I change the things that I accept responsibility for while recognizing that I only have responsibility for one thing, me, because that's all I truly can change. Mm -hmm. And I let them know that I'm not interested in changing other people because I can't control them. And then I usually get one of two typical reactions. The first is just a deer in the headlights look where it's like, wait, what? <laughs> Did you just say? <laughs> say that again slowly. I think it might have been important. <laughs> or I get, "Did you just judge me?" I'm like, "No, I'm telling you that's what I do." And often, and I've never had a response from somebody who is genuine about it. Actually, come back and just say, "You know what? You're full of." crap about it it's they almost always come back and say something along the lines of i'm glad you explained that or they'll come back and they'll say that by asking me a bunch of other questions about well how do you solve this or how do you fix that and i don't actually always tell them directly how to solve those issues i just say hey look this is this is how i this is how i would do it i don't know what you're working on but this is this is this is how i would solve it if I was in that situation and this is why and then this is how you could do it but I don't know what the context of whatever it is that you would be dealing with that in and so people get to they sit there at ease with with you and they get the they get that trust in there and over time that trust loyal uh, builds up and turns into loyalty and you get that connection that way there because I find it difficult to make the connection through small talk mm -hmm. It's just not my style. It's it's just not me. That's all you. But I'm the more problem solver, and so I get it. In, I get it that way. There, um, not all of us are going to make make instant connections like that. So we all have different skills. We all have different abilities and different talents, and we just need to explore those. But no matter what, I think I think the big thing is going to be always that we should not ever try to mask emotions, and definitely don't don't try to subdue them. Because once we do that, then that takes away a large portion of our humanity, and I think that would be something that would be rather dangerous uh, to the philosophy of voluntarism, to the maintenance and improvement of 
any individual's quality of life. Yeah, so the the idea of phrase my, my feels, <laughs> I have never used that phrase until now <laughs> because it's just not useful. Of course, people have feelings and emotional connections to the state. You know, of course, we you know there, there's a saying um, in in Chinese medicine because uh, I'm an acupuncturist, right, an herbalist. So the saying in Chinese medicine that a hundred percent of of disease has an emotional component, <laughs> right? So emotions are wrapped up in everything that we do and think and believe. And to think that we can divorce that from, you know, our, our thoughts and actions is um, it's pretty absurd and pretty naive, I think. So I think, you know, we have to recognize that, of course, people are going to have emotional connections to these belief systems. And, and so I think it's just about examining a person's the, the roots of, of why they believe what they believe examining them you know with genuine interest and you know not trying to attack not trying to prove them wrong just just asking questions right very very coolly very calmly and in that way sometimes they figure out the contradictions in their own logic and you don't even have to do anything <laughs> that's beautiful that's when, a great part when that happens oh it's, it's been so beautiful and, and, and sometimes that, that, that does happen, you know, like, like they say when you, um, in a relationship, when a man talks to a woman and, you know, most often they say the woman needs to express herself more and the man, <laughs> not so much, but sometimes the woman doesn't even need you to give solutions or suggestions. All she wants you to do is listen. And sometimes in that talking that she does, she finds her own solutions. <laughs> It's kind of interesting. And uh, and uh, most of the time I rely on that when my wife is talking to me. <laughs> I'm like, do I really have to solve this problem? Let me just let her talk. <laughs> oh, that's so, okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I think that's very, um, that's a very valuable tool as well is, is, you know, just gently asking questions and probing and, and being curious about a person's belief system and, uh, and the way their mind works and, in that process, many times they discover certain contradictions and certain inconsistencies, and uh, and they will own up to that. And they'll, if they're honest with themselves, with themselves, they'll say, you know, wow, I've never thought of that. That doesn't make sense. Why do I believe this? Right? <laughs> and, and so that's a beautiful thing. So you're so it's, it's the idea of of um, you know you can lead. Uh, you know, just like you lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink, right? You, you can lead a person to knowledge, but you can't make them think, <laughs> right? Same, right? Same sort of thing. So, so yeah, that's kind of uh, how I look at that. <laughs> that's a, is a, so emotional connections, that's something that I have written about a number of times in other works that I've done, particularly when people feel like they are in, emotionally invested in their support of the state or whatever it is that they did. So like my parents, my parents, for example, I don't talk to them a whole lot. I don't know if I will ever talk to them again. Uh, we've got some differences of opinion and other things that are going on where we just don't – for whatever reason, we just don't talk. There's always some sort of conflict there, and I know that a part of it is due in, to the fact that I am – I've written two books about liberty and morality. I – openly dissent against the state, but I never call for violence. And I think they do not take kindly to that because they spent 30 years as government employees. My father also as a member of the U.S. Army. And they do all that time, all that work, 30, 40, 50 years of their lives. And then suddenly their firstborn tells them that their, their support of the state is wrong. Mm. It's a powerful hit to their history. And I I think that they don't know how to handle that maybe sometimes. They think that I'm just spitting in their face maybe. Mm. But I never once told them that they're wrong. Even in even in the other works that I have written and shared with them, I have never said it's wrong. It's just a very expensive lesson to learn. It took them 30, 40, 50 years to learn this 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 particular lesson. <laughs> They worked for everything that they gave. They worked for everything. 
but they're not wrong. They're just nescient. They just didn't know any better. Or they didn't feel like they had a different choice. They didn't understand how to seek a different choice. Or maybe they didn't even have the courage to seek a different choice. I don't know. But that's a very difficult thing to work for something and then to be told suddenly, oh, no, there's a more efficient or a more effective way. Not even to tell them that they're wrong, but just to tell them that there's a more efficient way of achieving what it was that they they were doing. There's a lot of pride and a lot of emotions in – the work that people do. And I think that's the same thing with a lot of a lot of advocates of government. And I find actually that a lot of advocates of government and dissenters of government end up being in the same camp of thought mm-hmm. in terms of trying to get the other side to see their perspectives. People who support government, especially especially a lot of older individuals who support government and have openly done so and advocated for voting one political party or another or jump ship and change sides and all that, they get told by the center of government that they're wrong or that they're just – there's more efficient ways of doing it, and it's just a big slap in the face. And then this is what's interesting. This is why a lot of people will read things that I have written talking about how the centers of government are actually maybe even more dangerous to their own cause than are advocates of government. Because the centers of government typically understand more closely why government is destructive. It might be noble in intent if they even recognize that, but it's still destructive by how it achieves that noble goal. And these individuals, if they're challenged, such as like if somebody asks, well, what's the deal with natural law? Well, natural law and a lot of indications of it requires faith spiritual spirituality well how is asking me to blindly believe in something that's that's it's faith driven or spiritual driven with no tangible empirical evidence how is asking me to do that not the same as asking me to believe that the police officer is not going to beat me or shoot me or kill me if i pull over and i'm peaceful in my interactions with them how is that not a lesser of the of the police officer's actions. How is that not the same as religion, which is saying, if you don't believe this or else now, when that challenge to natural law is issued, it's not that there's any negative ramifications for not following natural law. It's just that if a justification for doing good can be created out of something that requires faith, a justification for doing negative or destructive or bad, can also be derived from that request just to just to have faith in it. There's no clear path of thought progression, no clear complete path of thought progression, and no clear path clear complete and linear path of thought progression. Like building one small thought on top of another thought on top of another thought. Just like we learn to perform mathematics, we have to learn by by labeling numbers and then counting and then adding and then sub- and then multiplying and, and so on until we get to each step where until we can eventually perform linear equations and, and use uh, PEMDAS or whatever it is in order to make those happen. And that takes a lot to learn. So when that's presented, dissenters of government, advocates of government, uh, religious individuals, atheists, all of them, everybody seems to go through these phases where while they're still learning, they get incredibly emotionally upset about – what's going on and they don't like it but notice i didn't say that while they are just doing their thing i made sure to to say that while they're still learning because everybody is still learning Mm. and that's the important part is to recognize that everybody is still learning everybody's going to be on a different path of, of thought but the end goal is always the same everybody is always seeking to maintain and improve the quality of their life they may not realize that's what they're doing, but that is exactly what they're doing. Whatever path or portion of the path to achieving this means or this goal they're on may look like an entirely wrong path, but we don't know every every step they took in order to get to where they're at. All we know is that they are on a similar path to we are. It's just that their terrain is a little different than us. And I think that that is something where the logical part – needs to be used to reinforce the emotional part, but the logical part should always be first. 
if the emotional thinking is is first, then what happens is we get into these changes of, of mentality. It ends up becoming, say, like if we have if we have a emotionally fueled logical argument and we have a logically fueled emotional argument, that's the difference between vindication and revenge. Now, vindication is I just want the world to know that I didn't do this. I was innocent. I'm not guilty of these things here. I just want that and that that's that'll give me everything I need. To make peace with the situation. Hmm. That's logical. Logic fueled by emotion. That's what that is. Because hmm. it's it, they're looking for peace. Hmm. But revenge. Revenge is, nope, kill them. Make them pay. Make them feel the way I feel. Hmm. Frustrated. Angry. Upset. A bunch of internal, hostile, turbulence. Whatever you want to call it. That's emotion driven by logic where all that you can see is make the other person change to a negative mindset. It's the difference between the two. And I think that if, if we take the time to get other people to encourage them to talk about things, let them express their, their feelings, express their ideas and opinions let them know that they have all the time in the world to formulate their thoughts when discussing ideas like voluntarism. Let them know they have plenty of time. Don't put them on a spot. Just say, look, man, take as much time as you need. I'm willing to continue this conversation, but if you don't feel like you can, you can convey the ideas that you have now, that's okay. Write them down, come back, and get a hold of me and let me know what you think. I will make time. And I think that that right there is the difference, another difference that you can see between individuals who are very emotional and they feel those emotions with logic versus individuals who, nope, answer now, answer now, answer now. I'm going to hold you accountable now. Hold you accountable now for things that you don't understand yet. Mm. That's emotions, emotional arguments fueled by logic. And it has its place, but it does not have a place for long except for in the moment, learning to find the next stepping stone of thought. Yeah, you know, one thing that really resonated with me is, you know, when you said how we're all on the path of learning, right? And I think that's so important to stress because so many people, especially anarchists, a lot of anarchists and volunteers, um, have this idea that, you know, I guess like born again Christians. <laughs> I know, I know the uh, what is it? The answer, the the righteous path, the you know, the way that everyone should follow, and people need to know this. And people need to follow it too. You know, it may be that we have put a lot of effort and time into researching and investigating these ideas, and that's true. But like you said, people come at this from different perspectives, right? And so we must not come at it from the perspective of you know we're superior because we have this knowledge but but rather we have maybe or the way i look i like to look at it is we come at it from um that we just have another way of thinking about it, a different perspective and we and that's what we can offer that's what we can bring to the table you know and say you know have you considered this <laughs> rather than saying no you're wrong I'm right, <laughs> you know, and just and beating them over the head with this, uh, you know, intellectual two by four, which uh, very rarely produces uh, positive results. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it's, it's definitely very important that to realize that even though we have done all this investigation and research, we ourselves are still learning constantly, right? And I think volunteerism comes from a place of humility, right? Um, most volunteers, I think, have to be humble in the sense that they have to have come to that conclusion by subjecting all of their previously held beliefs under scrutiny and examination. And when people do that, and, and not many people can do that, right? Because it's very painful and it's very uncomfortable to think, yeah, to say that so. most things that I believed may have been wrong. Like not, not many people are willing to do that. And so I think if if a person is willing to do that, to me, that demonstrates a very large capacity for humility, 
for saying I was wrong. I was bamboozled. I was fooled. And I'm willing to search for the truth, whatever that may be. And, uh, and so that's, that takes an extraordinary amount of, of humility. And so it's very important that we maintain <laughs> that humility even after we have learned about all this stuff. And, and, and also to me, that's what, that's, humility is at, the, is at the center. It's the essence of altruism because it's like, I, I don't know how to run your life, right? I barely know how to run my own life. <laughs> I'm not a master of myself. I'm still learning about myself, right? So if I'm still learning about myself, how can I know what's best for you, right? And so that's one of the major reasons why, to me, why authority is Ill illegitimate, right? No, no person can know how to run another person's life, right? And and uh, how much, how much less, how much, how much more absurd is it when you, when a person claims to be able to run 300 million people's lives <laughs> so yeah to me humility is definitely at the essence at the heart of volunteerism um and it's so important to um you know to push that point home absolutely that is something that uh, a lot of people i think they get into this thing where i can't let them know that i don't know this you know they it's saying I don't know is not a weakness. I don't understand why people think that that's something that's to be shameful for. I mean, I, I still don't understand that. And I used to do that all the time. And one of the things that I remember growing up, I remember my dad would be very upset with me. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And in the moment, being totally fear stricken, my cognitive abilities were nope, not even there. And here we are, we have we have adults, we have people 18, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, talking to one another, demanding answers, putting them on a spot, and it's still fear. We're like, no, I've got to give them an answer right now. So yeah, it's it's not it's okay to say I don't know, but the issue the issue ends up being that the people who receive that response I don't know. A lot of times they're met with, well, maybe you shouldn't be getting involved in other people's lives and messing it all up and ruining things for everybody, and then they guilt trip them, and then they use emotions as or they use these these tactics, these, these emotional fear based tactics to make somebody else encourage them to feel bad about themselves that's used in place of of a gun like a police officer would if you don't pull over they are going to uh choose to escalate the situation to deadly force in order, in order to get you to comply well a lot of dissenters of government a lot of anarchists do the same thing to other individuals oh you don't know well then you're part of the problem no we're not the problem only starts when you, you refuse to admit you don't know or when you try to accuse other people of being the problem when you yourself don't understand what you're fully trying to explain or advocate. And that ends up being something else where it's just as you mentioned the superiority issue. Well, we're not superior because we have wisdom or skills or otherwise. We are only superior for one thing to other individuals, and that's when we continue to self-improve and they stop. That's it. We all have essentially the same abilities to learn certain things, to do certain things. Some of them are a little different than others, but they're all if you were to take if you were to take three dots and draw them on a piece of paper, uh, one is a, a yellow dot, one is a yellow orange dot, and the other is an orange dot. And you make those one centimeter dots and you and you look at it about ten inches from your face. Then you step 10 feet away. Are you really going to notice the difference between all of those dots? Or is it going to look like one big dot if you draw if you drew them all close together within one centimeter of each other as well? <laughs> They're all going to look the same. So that's what it's like for all of what we can and can't do. So that's why we're not superior to anyone until other people stop trying to self-improve. So long as we're trying to do that, we're pretty much all equal as far as I'm concerned. But the moment we stop doing that, mm -mm, nope, that's when that's when things change. That's when people start 
getting these emotionally charged arguments that are driven by or are led by emotions and are fueled by logic, and then they get into all these logical fallacies. And that's, that's a, we started this off with logical fallacies, didn't you? Where that was the big thing. Hmm. Where I find it interesting also that a lot of the centers of government, a lot of anarchists, they go through this thing where they're saying everything is a logical fallacy, but then the moment their position gets challenged, they get upset and angry, and then they start employing almost the same logical fallacies to defend their positions as as did the uh, the centers of government they were uh, supposedly dropping truth bombs on that's another thing that uh, emotions uh, end up causing issues for for a lot of people when they don't understand them yeah <clears throat> yeah definitely these um yeah these are these are skills that people need to learn and they're applicable in you know so many so many areas of our lives just you know the ability to communicate the ability to talk to convey messages in a non-threatening way so so very important um <clears throat> and and you know i, I want to go back to your your parents and that you said that they were government employees and they uh -huh. felt very uh threatened by you even though I don't. I don't know if you did or not. Or like, I, I assume you did not. Like, tell them that you know everything they did in their life was wrong. Nope. <laughs> all, you, all you did was write a book, and that's how they interpreted it. Right? Uh, they interpreted yeah. it as an attack on them. Yeah, and then and that's just sad. <laughs> you know, that's just again. You know what that points to is actually the inability to recognize that you're still learning. <laughs> you know, Maybe. It, right? So it seems like they have already made the decision that what they did in their life in their, in their lives was right and was um was beyond reproach right beyond criticism uh and that's unfortunate <clears throat> that's you know i i i, I always I, i've written that living and learning are you know is is inseparable you can't you cannot live and you know you can't separate living and learning they happen simultaneously constantly right people stop learning in essence to me they have died in a way, maybe a spiritual death, right? If you stop learning, if you become rigid, if you, if you become inflexible in your thinking, then, you know, a part of you has died, right? Because to me, that is what, that is what the human organism is. We, you know, we have the, um, the, the neofrontal cortex, right? We have an amazing ability to learn new skills, to solve complex problems with our minds, right? We are currently the dominant species, not because of our brute force strength, right? <laughs> you know, try try a, 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 an adult male uh, human being against an adult male uh, grizzly bear, <laughs> you know? So we are not the strongest animal by far, but what has given us such wealth and prosperity and what has allowed us to survive over 7 billion people on earth is the fact that we're able to use our minds and solve complex problems and and that's and that's so important so when people do not do that when they reject the the learning of new information they are in essence rejecting their they say the tradition, the human tradition, you know, they're, 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 they're rejecting human nature, which is to learn and to solve complex problems. So, <laughs> so, so another way you could say it is when people stop learning, they become spiritually dead, but then they also stop being a human being, <laughs> which, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if that's a good thing to tell someone, <laughs> but, but in a sense that does happen. So, but no, I, I think that's actually a really good point. Um, we are, as far as we understand, the dominant species on this planet in terms of what we can do. Mm. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we rep that we recognize things past, present, and future. I mean, we can see this and more beyond just the moment, and that's mm. what pretty much everything else looks at. Right. And I think that's a fairly rare thing when compared to every other species that we are aware of and share this planet with. So yeah, we have we don't have the strength of a bear or or, or a tiger or the speed of a ostrich or a cheetah or whatever but we have something else we have the ability to communicate information faster hmm. there was a video i saw 
and I, I'm going to promote this on this thing here uh, because I think it was a fantastic video. It's by the uh, people over at Kurzgesagt. They did this video about uh, human evolution, and they talk about how communication has changed everything for humanity. And we went from – before, if you think about this, and I'll link this in the description below with the video so that uh, all of our listeners and viewers can see that for themselves. But they talk about how before we developed semi-complex language, information about what was going on in the world had to be acquired from two different ways. And the first was through genetic transfer from one from one generation to the next. That changed things and allowed us to, to to learn different things and to know when we need to go to sleep, when we need to, to go hunt, and when we need to move north or south for the winter or summer or whatever it is. And then the other is by learning as soon as we are available to do for ourselves. Now that was a very – the first is a very slow and inefficient means of transferring knowledge. The second is a little faster. But then the moment we are able to communicate uh, semi-complex ideas, then we are able to transfer. We are able to do a number of things. One of the first things is we're able to, re to, to exchange information, retain information much longer, and then pass information down from generation to generation much faster as well. And those are three things that are incredibly important. And I think that is something that when you brought up my parents again that – I don't think they and a lot of other individuals, uh, advocates of government, the centers of government alike, they don't take that into consideration. Even though they have the ability to look in the past and they can look at the future and see what they are going to do by changing themselves, they typically only live in the present and they just know now, now, now. And I think that they, they totally miss an opportunity every single day. They miss these opportunities. Are they wrong? No. They're not wrong. What's the what's the criteria used to invoke whether they're right or wrong? No, they're just – they want change. They want something better to maintain and improve the quality of their lives. But do they do anything to change themselves? And it's how much are they learning? How quickly are they learning? And then how much are they allowing their emotions to get in the way, their pride, their, their whatever it is that they, that they cling to? How much of that is getting in their way from them changing themselves? If we if we don't change, the only thing that we can change in this world, the rest of the world isn't going to change either. And if we don't change ourselves, well, good luck on making anything fanciful happen in your lifetime. <laughs> yeah, as they say, the only the only thing that's constant is change, right? Those people who are stagnant, who yeah, who lack movement or, or who lack the ability to grow, develop, adapt. Um, learn new things to to adjust to new situations to uh, new technologies will suffer will fall by the wayside they they will not fare well you know so if if a person goes to college and they learn let's say computers in college and then they <clears throat> they realize when they graduate that the, most of the knowledge they learned was obsolete <laughs> when they graduate because technology is moving so swiftly you have to continue learning. You have to look. You have to grow. And you have to adapt, and it's uh, it's constant. It's relentless. So so definitely, we we must recognize um, that change is constant, right? That we cannot stay stagnant in our belief systems, in the way we interpret the world. You know, the 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 brightest visionaries that we respect and honor are those people that sought to change their uh, existing reality right and they they overturned it with um, with fascinating ideas with with new and innovative ideas that perhaps most people during their time laughed at and ridiculed them for and mocked and scorned them <laughs> which is kind of the the uh, the irony the supreme irony of it is that these are the people these are the movers that create wealth and that and that lift uh, has lifted helped lift humanity out of poverty, out of dire poverty, 
And yet during their own times, many of them were not appreciated. And most of, most of them have only been appreciated posthumously. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a great quote uh, by this guy, I forget his name. He says, every, every society reveres its, its dead trouble, troublemakers and honors its live conformists. <laughs> <laughs> right so we for some reason maybe because change is difficult maybe because learning new things is difficult um but most people do not recognize the the um the value of new ideas right um but in order to progress in order to improve in order to raise our standard of living we have to recognize how powerful new ideas are and how they can really change the world for the better most of the time so so yeah so and and and, I, and again with fields of work that you know technology has improved like for example car manufacturing right people used to put together cars and factories by hand right and then the machines came along started doing it they you know this it started to be automated and all those people put out of work now what are they going to do are they going to just <laughs> stay out of work and just wallow in their misery and their misfortune or are they gonna get back on get back on their horse and try to be valuable to the market and try to prove that no I, I can still be valuable i can still earn a living i can still make money doing something else right because uh my mind is 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 uh is flexible and can adapt so i think that's the that's the challenge for most people uh, that they have to overcome. Did you just did you just use the analogy of automobile back, automobile makers and and then if they decide not to do that because they don't want to change, they're going to get back on a horse instead <laughs> of make their own automobile. I didn't, re I didn't recognize that. That's good. <laughs> there was, it's like it's like saying, "Oh man, this electricity thing. Oh, man, we're about to go from wired from, from wired AC electrical units from house to house." We're gonna to go to I don't know a Tesla unit where everybody's <laughs> generating their own energy, own energy. Ah, you know what? I'm going back to candles. Forget this. <laughs> get but, my, get wow, my... <laughs> I was really worried there for a moment. I should I should have used the horse and buggy and, and the uh, and the and the car and the car that, analogy. Actually. I should have did that. <laughs> I, you know, I was, I was totally waiting for that. But yeah, no, change is definitely uh, <laughs> definitely difficult when there are expectations or judgments about how things should be, mm. and tying this into emotions when there are expectations of what emotions are acceptable and what are not oh that just makes it even messier hmm. but like say take for example that positive emotions are the ones that are okay but a lot of people when somebody's angry and upset they have physical uh, cues that say to other people i am angry Everybody avoids those people. Nobody seems to ever want to make time to interact with those individuals. Well, they're angry. They might do something horrible to me. Right, but they're angry for a reason. This is where this is where voluntarism is transformed from regular anarchism to anarchism plus empathy. That's what happens with voluntarism. That's why voluntarism is voluntarism. And it's not just regular anarchism. It's because we we choose as voluntarists, we choose to have empathy for others as well as for ourselves. So we put this big focus on positive emotions all the time to the point where it almost seems to become uh, sickening. You know, you ever you ever come across those people who are who are exceptionally nice all the time <laughs> you ever you ever come across those people or or i love the way that certain television shows or, or movies they play these people to be insanely nice <laughs> and then they end up being insanely evil at the end of the program or take the lady uh dolores umbridge from harry potter where mm -hmm. she was this lady in pink uh cat pictures on everything <laughs> and Oh, oh, everything is cheeky and roses and sunshine and rainbows. And <laughs> she turns out to be probably more hated than Lord Voldemort at the very end of the show. It was just ridiculous. And um, 
I was just like, so, so we have to be able to understand that, that all emotions should be made time for. And uh, when we do, when that doesn't happen, how do we expect change? How do we, how do we expect to, to be able to accept change when it does come? You know, no, everybody puts a stigma on things that are not what we expect they should be. We judge all sorts of things and we oftentimes prematurely and incorrectly or grossly inefficiently judge them before we even have full context of the situation. So next time somebody's upset and angry, and I've been trying to work on this myself because I, because of the way I was, I was raised, I have a personal barrier to get over in terms of approaching people who are angry and upset. But I work on this every single day and I make time for people who are upset, who are feeling negative emotions and say, hey, listen, is there anything I can do to help? Because I understand what it's like to be that angry and upset and afraid and usually end up being able to make a connection that way as well. Sometimes it's not my go-to for sure like we were talking about previously, but it is something that we can change other people by changing who we are. And it's not so much that we're really changing them, but we can encourage them to change. We can encourage them to go from a negative, destructive emotion like anger and get them to turn that into something positive. And we can – maybe. I don't know if we can or not because this is still really – it's the overly happy people still really scare me for some reason. I don't know why. It's really strange, but – Maybe we can get away from that overly positive, overly happy outlook too where we realize that not everything is sunshine and rainbows and roses. Not everything is like that. We need to be able to look at everything. And I think if we start looking at the bigger picture, just like we were talking – I was talking about earlier with the advocates of government, the dissenters of government where each is only seeing a couple of puzzle pieces on the big picture, mm. if we zoom back and look at all emotions – and see what they're there for. I think that will also do a tremendous amount of good to help out our ideologies and ideas about voluntarism, as well as every other uh, political ideology out there as well. I think eventually once every idea idea is broken down, every philosophy is broken down in terms of interacting with other individuals, I think it will eventually all come back to just being voluntarism instead of everything else. I'm still it's still an idea that I'm working on, but if if I can keep going with that, I think in a few in a few months or years I'll be able to break that down and get to that point there. But I I truly do believe that uh, by understanding all of these things here and breaking down concepts, that eventually voluntarism will end up being the go-to philosophy in terms of uh, interacting with other individuals. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, uh, definitely agree with that. So we're coming up on the hour, so so we're gonna give our closing remarks. But yeah, I um, I I also definitely believe that yeah, voluntarism is is really the ultimate philosophy, and that you know it's like I guess the umbrella term that encapsulates all other philosophies, you know, except statism, of course. But <laughs> um, you know that <clears throat> there's so many ways to live, right? We're, we're not, you know, it's it's um. How do you say it's it's a descriptive philosophy, not a prescriptive philosophy, right? So it just describes the basic skeletal structure of how reality works, how basic economics works, right? But it doesn't like you don't go to voluntarism to seek truth or to learn wisdom or to learn <laughs> how to get enlightened. <laughs> That's not what you go to volunteers for. You know, it, it gives you basic principles to live by and basic um, understanding of morality. And that's it. And that's all, you know, you know, it's all about basic, these basic principles. So it just describes reality, but it doesn't tell you how you should live, right? You can be, you can live according to the basic principles of volunteerism and still be a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it would be fair to say that uh, voluntarism is about giving you the peace of mind to be able to achieve the goals that you want in life and without fear of of others trying to hinder your ability to do so peacefully? Um yeah, yeah, basically it it 
it just it just shows you um the negative aspect of of morality like what you should not do basically right so it doesn't tell you what you should do how you should act how you should live your life just what you should not do um you know the idea of negative rights so that, that's kind of the way i look at it it's just um and, and that's why I love it. You know, it doesn't tell you how you should live your life. It leaves that up to you. You live your life how you want, right? It leaves it very open. And I love that. I love the simplicity. I love the rudimentary nature of the philosophy. And um, and so, so yeah. So so uh, wrapping up with with emotions. Uh, <laughs> it yeah yeah emotions. I think yeah definitely has a role in in volunteerism in how we communicate with our fellow human beings, right? Because we are simultaneously logical and emotional beings, right? And, and we cannot divorce the two. And when we attempt to do so, I think that will uh, come to disastrous consequences, right? So I think we, we should recognize that that both of the, those aspects of, the, of our intellect, of our mind, have a place, right? And have value. And there's nothing wrong with that. So uh, I definitely encourage a lot of people who wish to convey messages of, you know, volunteerism and anarchism and free markets to, to really work on their ability to uh, appeal to people in a non-threatening way, right? And, uh, and, and to figure out what is their emotional attachment to their belief system and just, you know, just ask questions, just ask questions. And like I said before, many times they will come to the conclusions or the solutions themselves or they will recognize their own contradictions without you even ever having to point it out to them so and that's the wonderful that's the best way to do it i, I think um because they they did it themselves you know it, it wasn't you <laughs> they opened the door they read the book and they did the thinking and and that's the outcome that you want so not bad at all not bad at all i'm gonna leave it with uh as voluntarists, uh, I think we are our own masters. We accept the things that we cannot change, and we change the things that we accept responsibility for. So while we're recognizing that we only have responsibility for one thing, and that's our individual selves, because that's the only thing that we can truly change. And that includes understanding how to change our attitudes, our emotional outlooks, and our mindsets. So if we want to see a change in the world, then we need to change ourselves first. Excellent. Yes. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening uh, to the philosophy of volunteerism with uh, Danilo and Jim. So we will catch you all on the next episode. Have a wonderful day.